The question in my mind is, how do you create or relaunch a highly profitable and successful six to seven figure business? With so much conflicting advice about the best ways to start and grow your business, how do you get it right the first time? I want to help entrepreneurs make a real difference and navigate the messy world of startup or relaunch. My name is John North, and this is the Startup Secrets for Entrepreneur Show. Join me today when we dig deep with our guests and get you the best blueprint so you can fast track your own business. This episode is sponsored by Volpreneur.app, your all-in-one online business system. Make sure you subscribe for future episodes at StartupSecrets.show right now. So let's get into the day's episode. You're listening to the Startup Secret Show for Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, John North, and my very special guest today is Robert Jabalia. I hope you'll have to get you to help me with this one, man. <laughs> How do you pronounce I'm used it? used to it. Siglum Paglia. Siglum Paglia. There you go. I got it. <laughs> I said it really quick. So welcome to the show, and it's it's um, it's great to talk to you because you've got a really interesting background. Um, you're a, you actually can say you're a, you play a lawyer on TV because you're actually a lawyer and a, and an actor. So that's quite an interesting kind of scenario. So uh, we can dig into that for sure. Sure, great to be here. Thanks. Cool. So um, your background: Did you start as a lawyer and then become an actor, or did you start as an actor and become a lawyer? I'm guessing probably the other way around. But I started as a lawyer. And um, I became a voiceover artist, right? Which is a faction of acting. And then I started doing on camera after that and theater. So that was the order of things. Okay. So you should have got a, you should have got the job of Better Call Saul. You would have been more qualified, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty qualified now, I think. But I don't, I don't know how he stays in practice with things. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> he probably doesn't give you guys a good name at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. In fact, we played clips of that at the Bar Association during the ethics class. So, all oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, John Cleese, when they used to have the um, faulty towers, he used to actually that was built as a sales training video to train people on what what to do. So, right, exactly. Yeah, so it's quite bizarre. I think the crazy thing about lawyering is it's a pretty boring job, really. At the end of the day, like there's not like on TV where they wrap it all up in an hour. Like there's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of work. I wouldn't call it. It's, it's some parts are boring. I'm, I like depends what I do. I enjoy area. what I do. Yeah. Yep. It depends on the area. If you're able to um, be fortunate enough as, as me and be able to pick the areas of law you want to practice, then it's, mm. I find it very interesting. But yeah. it is a lot of work. Mm. You know, and that's why they, they grill you in law school <laughs> to get you, get you used to all the, all the work. Yeah, so. get, you, get you ready. <laughs> so um, give us a bit of a story about where you, like, what, you, what you've done in all, to get to where you were. So you started as a lawyer. Did you start off as a lawyer in the first place or did you like you go to law school and end up as a lawyer in the end or was there sort of a transition from there? No, I, I, I right out of, um, after I graduated college, I went to law school. I didn't take any time off or anything. Then I became a lawyer um, and I was practicing for about 10 years or so. Let me think about 15 years. I was practicing goes fast and um, <laughs> it goes very fast. Yeah. And um, so I was just, you know, was kind of in a rut um, day to day job, mm. more than four, much more than 40 hour a week job, you know, probably 60 to 80 uh, hours. So I was getting a little burned out. So uh, I always, I always, I was a DJ back in college. Um, I always, I I always was kind of behind the scenes on any of the, of the plays or the shows where I would be the tech, I'd be, you know, I'd work the tech, I'd work the camera, I'd work the soundboard, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I always had that little interest in the arts. So one day I I was just um, flipping through an adult education um, manual that uh, was here that, that came in the mail. Um, and I had I had done a couple other adult education things in the past. I had taken like a golf um, class on golf and, you know, a couple other things. So I, I, I came across a, a class on voiceover. And, it, you know, basically said, you know, have you ever wanted to act with your voice, make money with your voice, be a cartoon character, do commercials, you know, come try it out. So that's what I did. I signed up and um, I took the uh, I took the class and I, I, I fell in love with voiceovers. I wanted to, I wanted to pursue it. Um, 
like I really thought I could do it. It, uh, it became a passion. So I, t- I took some more training. I um, ended up doing a demo, a couple of demos for commercial narration. And at the time when I started, about 15 years ago, that's when the websites were starting to pop up so that you can do auditions from, from your home. Mm-hmm. Uh, from your, you, know, you could also buy equipment. It was, equipment was getting cheaper to buy so that you could do recordings from, from your house. Because you used so to do this in a really proper studio, right? Like, you know, the equipment was very expensive and you couldn't do it. Yeah, exactly. Right. The equipment now that you can get from home equals the equipment from, you know, huge million dollar studios, you know, back years ago, yeah. um, you know, for a fraction of the cost with yeah. the same quality because it's, it's digital. So, yeah. Um, so basically what I started, I did some auditions and, um, I got a, I got a gig pretty quickly, like about a month after I was auditioning <clears throat> and it was for the American experience, um, series on PBS national C- series. Wrong. Camel Scott is, is the narrator of that, that show. And I got picked to do a couple of, uh, of foreign voices where I did the English overdubs. So I got to go down to Broadway Sound right at the uh, Rockefeller Center. Oh, um, nice. That's where that's where they do the um, the post for Saturday Night Live right in those studios, and that's how that's how I started started my my voiceover career, and wow. um, and from there I just started doing acting after that, and you know things kind of just took off from there. It, so I guess at the end of the day, like you know, acting obviously actors spend a lot of time on voice because that's something that's. The, you know, yes. people hear that people hear the voice before they see the thing, and I always <laughs> people like, you can have a really bad video, but if you've got bad audio, you can you're doomed. <laughs> like, Correct. You know, you, people will sacrifice video for audio, but they won't do it the other way around. Correct. Yeah, and, and voice is one of the. That's one of the the basis, the foundations for acting. Voice, and then of course there's movement, um, and emotion. You know, when you when you start to get onto on camera things and theater and it all relates back to voiceover too your know, voiceover is acting it's a form of acting with its own techniques and they all have their own they all have their own little techniques to them voiceover versus film versus tv versus theater so i studied all of those all of those things all those different things you know and it all comes back down to acting mm-hmm. you know you know again voice movement yep. um, those are all integral parts you know same thing as, as an attorney you know you, mm-hmm. you need to be able to speak you need to be able to Stay still when you need to stay still, you know, not move around to distract, <laughs> the, poker face, distract right? the jury. <laughs> the poker face. Right. Well, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. And I guess that's those why, the, why those lawyers skills over so well on TV, right? Because it's a very emotional, you know, like a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a good storyline to work off when you're talking about lawyers, because at the end of the day, you can, um, you know, you've got that whole range of things going on that, that connects everything together, doesn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, and, and lawyers are, are what they're trying to do is obviously make a connection with mm-hmm. the, the jury to tell their client's story. You know, that's basically what you do it as an actor. You're telling the writer's story, making a connection to, to the audience. That's it's very similar. Um, that's about where the similarities end because <laughs> <laughs> you know acting uses a much more emotional, mm. deep ex, you know experience. You have to go really deep emotionally mm. to. to um, do a, a lot of the characters, you know, I can play an attorney easily. Like you said, <laughs> I don't yeah. need to make it a, an you emotional know what's You actually know the law. Like, I mean, <laughs> what's that? It's, it's, at least you know the law. At least you can say, well, okay, that can't be right. That's not right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get called yeah. to play attorneys all the time, you know, and that's yeah. that, you know, that, that doesn't take much emotional connecting because it's, you know, I, I know it very well. So, um, you know, other characters, um, where I play a you know, depressed dad or mm. um, a serial killer, <laughs> so, you know, something like that. Obviously, it takes a lot more. There's a lot more work involved mm. in um, learning the character. So, and I think the other thing too with like um, with acting is that it, it can be quite repetitive because, if, particularly when you're doing those sort of shows. Like I remember as a kid, I went and watched this movie, a uh, movie being filmed called The Irishman, which is a long, long time ago. Now I was like, t- I was in that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I was still in Australia. What are you doing in Charters Towns? <laughs> oh, what, the Irishman? Did you yeah, so Irishman? not the new one. This is um, not the new one. Gotcha. Okay, if you were in that gotcha. one, very good work. Um, this was a really old Australian show that they filmed a movie, a film years and years ago. God, I don't know how long ago now. But I think gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But, Those are the new ones. 
I was still at high school. I was still, I think I was at primary school, and I actually went as a little excursion to go and see this this thing being filmed. And we were there for like two hours, and they filmed the same scene over and over and over again. And, yep. and, and I think people don't ever appreciate the amount of work that goes into filming two minutes. You know, like Correct. it's not, you know, the amount of times they take it and redo it and then, yeah, it's not the not the easiest gig. It's not the thing that people would think it is when they go, oh, I'll just show no. a bit of acting and go home. They're out for the, yep. the hours, you know, like it's not a... Not, not so, not as glamorous as it seems, that's for sure, yeah. But they, they, they average about five pages a day filming. Mm. That's the average, so... You know, they have to do different, obviously, different shots, different angles, uh, close-ups, and so mm-hmm. all that. They have to keep setting up the lights every time they do one of those different shots, so that, that's why it takes so long. Mm-hmm. So, And plus, you have to, you know, they, they no director wants just one take. You know, they want multiple takes so that uh, right. <laughs> the, the editor, well, so the editors can choose, too. They want to be able to make a choice on what they mm-hmm. what they like better, what fits better, you know, that it's... It's definitely a whole. Um, it's art and science at the, at the same <laughs> time. So, and then nowadays, movie, um, TV's becoming far more more like movies. Like they, you know, a lot of the series are put together, a lot of these you know, like DC stuff and everything. Are so so sophisticated in what they do that, and they manage to put an almost a film a movie every week. So it's <laughs> it's certainly come a long way. Yeah. From all those. So, oh, absolutely. You talked about TikTok before, like you, you actually, um, and I guess this is the big tech conversation because it's probably something that I sort of like worry about and, and I think is that big tech is getting so much more control over your life. And I was reading something the other day that said, <clears throat> let's say you've got a, um, a Google login and Google decides to ban you um, and you use your login to control your house and your and your security system and all that sort of stuff. Now you've lost control of everything that you actually take yeah. your own. And so I think True. there's a, a wake up call for privacy and and obviously this whole big tech controlling your life thing. So tell me a bit about the whole the TikTok story because it's sort of quite an interesting thing. It kind of yeah, sure. That's my that's my uh, that's my legal life. Yeah, that's my lawyer life. To your legal life so, for a second here. <laughs> so you know, I'm a voiceover artist. So um, many of the voiceover artists come to me for advice. Or if something happens legally, they'll come to me so I can represent them. So um, what happened was the original voice of TikTok is a voiceover artist that I know, one of my friends out of um, Canada. And she discovered that uh, TikTok was using her voice for the text-to-speech feature. Wow. Um, and she, she didn't give them permission to use her voice. She had done another job back in... I don't know, 2018 years ago um, for she had done just recorded the lines for them. That was supposed to be for a translation type of job. That's what they told her. And, and then apparently a TikTok bought this, these files from this company. And um, so my client and she ended up as the voice of TikTok, the text to speech voice. So we, uh, we filed a lawsuit to try to get her some compensation um, and they, they took her voice off now, which is, it's good for the time being, but mm. you know, we're, we're, we're working towards getting her back up there and getting some compensation for yeah. her, for the use the of her, is, her voice. Say that, or any of this sort of work, right? This, the, what people don't understand is that when you, when you do a job, then technically often there's royalties attached to that or, or annual renewals and things around that. So it's not just a case that you just did a voice job and you get paid. There's, there's more to it, right? Well, it, it, it could be where you don't necessarily get residuals but you should get paid fairly for the usage of of the job so you know if it's a job that's going to be like that tiktok where it's going to be used in all, all around the world from anybody who wants to, to use your voice you, you know the pay should be you should get paid accordingly to, sure. to how it's being used so it could be paid up front or it could be paid in residuals over time how are you know it doesn't really matter it's like method right? it's, 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 <laughs> it's, like exactly. your, it's like stealing something out of your house right same principle they've taken something that you technically own right Ex- exactly or you know it's like um you know giving you five cents for the original constitution of the united states that kind of thing you know mm-hmm. so you you're, you're giving away something the million dollars of value away for, for five cents you know under a, under some kind of uh false pretense so that that's how i equate this Mm. But it's also, it's also, you know, the artificial intelligence side of things. That's the scary part. Yes. Because 
technology is getting good enough now where you don't even really need to know that you're recording files. Like, like this podcast, for, for example, yep. technology is good enough where they can go take your voice and just yep. take all these old files and then they can create text to speech. Yeah. Synthetic voice of you, you know, so you can be saying things on some other website, you know, that was constructed, you know, by a script that someone uploads. So exactly. So that's it's quite scary, funny. I had a guy do time. this voiceover for me on LinkedIn. He just offered to do it right. And I played it to someone, a couple of people, and they go, Oh, that sounds like a robot did it. And I said, No, that's a human did it. And it's like now they can't tell the difference. Like now they think it's a robot and it's a human. All right. Now right. you're in big trouble. Right. It's getting it's getting very the very the the um robot voices or the, as you say the, the mm. text to speech voices are getting they're getting very sophisticated. So you know, actually, the, the technology is there where you can't even tell anymore. It, it doesn't sound like doesn't sound like a robot anymore. No, no, you know, like they're, exactly, yeah. Like uh, because what they can do now in film, um, speaking of acting in film, mm. is they can they can take the uh, soundtrack. So, so an, an actor acts an entire film, and they can take that the sound that they recorded for that film, and they can have the computer come in and do the uh the dialogue replacement at the end so if they need to replace a line or something like that they can have what was they can they don't need the actor to come in anymore wow they can do it by by computer so that's one of the one of the uh the way that technology yeah, AI, basically it's, it's actually teaching an ai how to speak your own it, exactly it's artificial yeah. intelligence it's much it's much more sophisticated than just you know text to speech like uh you know like the siri voice or the mm. the gps voices it's much more sophisticated now so. Siri was actually um, originally the, the the voice of Siri was an Australian. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, which most people she don't realize because obviously her accent. Yeah, she was living in Canada or something. She originally did the thing, but I see now that Siri's got all sorts of options now for voicing. But um, yeah, it was a real voice, and and I think so. Do you see this like if, if they're doing like animation is now so good that it's almost lifelike? Um, yep. And, and they've done these deep fakes now with various movies where people have passed away and they've actually, like Star Wars, they put people in um, to these movies and, and they weren't even, you know, they weren't even real in the first place in terms of right. they weren't even there. They were actually deceased. Right. You know? So do you see this whole industry kind of changing to something? Like, is there going to be a lot of, you know, even more unemployed actors and voiceover artists in the future? Do you, do you think there's going to be yeah. a, a shift there? I'm glad you asked this question. I just came back from a, conf a voiceover conference in Dallas and I was on the panel for artificial intelligence. And this was one of the questions that we were answering. And the, the panel was trying to figure out a, a way. One of the people on the panel are actually people that, uh, the company that creates these synthetic voices. Oh, okay. So the panel was you discussing how it, <laughs> well, was discussing how it can be done without putting the voiceover artist or the actor out of business. Mm -hmm. And one of the consensus that um, the industry wants to see happen is to create a, uh, like a clone, a synthetic voice yeah. that can do the voices, but still get paid residuals for the war, you know, for the voices that are done. So that's, that's one way. You have you to start somewhere, right? You just start with a real voice in the first place, right? Right. You take the real voice, they record all the files and then they have a, they'll have a, a clone, a clone voice. I call it, it's called a synthetic voice. And then they can have their, their clone do doing work, you know, automated and they'll get paid for each, whatever is read, whatever script is read. Mm -hmm. That's one way that they're trying to incorporate the technology so that the actors, you know, still can get revenue out of it. That was one, one thing that was discussed and, you know, who knows where it's going to go, but, Mm. You know, it, it, could, it has the potential, obviously, to, to put uh, put people out of work. So hopefully hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully they'll, it they'll do it ethically. So. It depends on people wanting the real thing. Like what I what I found is that when you do um, something that's a bit rough around the edges and, 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 you know, that sort of stuff, people appreciate that kind of rawness. And obviously that's why reality TV does so well um, and, it's, and it's cheap to produce. So I think the end of the day... Right. They're assuming that they're saving money and doing stuff, but will the ultimate audience turn around and go, "Look, I'm not listening to a computer. I don't want to." Listen well, right to now, right now, now, that yeah. that's the debate right now. Like that's that's the consideration right now. But as in the future, there's not going to be, you're not going to be able to tell. Mm. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. So that that's where it's going to get where we're going to need some kind of safeguards because the computers are getting so good now, and the artificial intelligence is getting so good, you will not be able to tell. That if that it was 
piece together like you can now. Control your destiny and create a complete business system for your online business. Evolvepreneur.app offers an easy and cost-effective way to build your online business by helping you avoid the pain and stress of implementing multiple systems, giving you the freedom to automate and scale. Support our sponsor by grabbing a free copy of Startup Secrets for Entrepreneurs at Evolvepreneur.app. But that technology is advancing very fast. Yeah. So it, it, uh, you know, you, you, you'll won't be, when you hear a recording, you won't be able to tell if it was recorded live or if it was, if it was a synthetic voice. So that, that's the scary part. And the, and the trouble with AI is that it's, it's, it's going into all sorts of areas. I mean, I've done watch a bit of stuff about this, but the reality is that if you have um, AIs can replace jobs. And I was reading this book about this concept mm-hmm. that about every 10 years, the role, the jobs will change dramatically. So you could work from being, you know, 10 years ago, you'd be a lawnmower repairman, and now you have to be a drone engineer. And, right. and that's a big shift between one and another. I mean, going from being a lawyer to voiceover doesn't seem like much, but there's a lot to it. Right. Um, and, and years of training and, and all that sort of stuff. So the concern here is that when people have to shift from one major profession to another, they're going to need time to train. And they're not, no one's going to pay for that. So you're basically going to be unemployed um, during a period of time to relearn. And the old job's not available anymore. And so you could actually become what they call a generation of useless people in that they don't have anything that, that they can actually do because those jobs have been taken away from them and they don't have the time or the skill set to learn something new. Yeah, it, it's very true. I was just talking to a friend of mine um, today who uh, he, one of, he's, um, he oversees the Mercedes factory. Um, you know, he does the logistics. So he went to visit the factory and he was telling me, you know, like most of the factory now, there's not, there's on the assembly line, there's, it's all ro- robots. There's no people yeah. that used to do all those jobs, you know, in Detroit, they used to, you know, so now there's very few people at the end that come in to do some of the stuff, but you know, it, it's, it's all replaced by technology. So, I mean, why can't uh, a synthetic voice replace a human i mean mm. if it could be done in them with a car <laughs> and to those standards, <laughs> you, build a car, you, know. you can you can build a voice right and i think so i mean it becomes an opportunity at the same time for an entrepreneur because when you look at the sure the way that things are shifting the question you've got to ask yourself is well what's the future look like will anybody have any money to spend on buying anything <laughs> are they all, all going to be either working for large corporations and these big tech guys or is there a, a way to kind of build something and take advantage of the of the you know of what's going to come, and, and right. a tricky one. Like I don't know, you know, you can't really predict the future. And the trouble is, you don't. You think you know what's going to happen in the future, but it doesn't happen the way you think. <laughs> right. Of course. I mean, but but every technology does create different jobs. So mm. there will be there definitely will be opportunities. What they will be, you know, like just voiceover alone. That's a perfect example. You know, the technology's gotten so so good that you can record studio quality broadcast quality from home i'm sure many things that you see on tv commercials or even narrations for um uh, documentaries Mm. were done out of a someone's home studio Mm. you know in broadcast quality so that technology that's over the past 10 or 15 years same kind of thing so we'll just create content for each other to watch and we'll do nothing else get paid by the government to sit there on your bum watch netflix all day (laughs) Sure, that sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> like a plan, right? So, um, so what's what's in the future for you right now? Is it um, where's your do you do so voiceover is kind of like your side gig that you do to thing, or is it something like you'd like to kind of make it a full time job? Or what's your what's your plan? Well, so I also produce. I produce films and TV shows. So I I do just as I do a good mix of lawyering. Acting and producing. That's a, a good, very good mix. Makes a very interesting day. I would imagine if you're switching between all three in one day too sometimes. <laughs> and, I, and I do. I do. And today yeah. was a perfect example. I had two voiceover auditions that came in that I had to record. I had an on-camera audition that came in that I had to record. And I had plenty of legal work that I had to record. And I just had a, I had a meeting for a, a film that we're producing next month. So oh, today was one of those days where yeah. it was ran the gamut. Um, you know, but it, it makes it, like you said, it makes it interesting for me. Yeah. Um, and they all, they all do, they all do interrelate. So, you know, the, 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 uh, the legal was how I got into everything. So that was because I learned the, I learned the business through the legal side. 
So that was how I was able to branch out to be a producer, mm. you know, because I would be, I would represent a lot of filmmakers that wanted like, you know, union papers done or, or contracts. Going on there, right? <laughs> you got a web of intrigue in there going on Right, there. right, yeah. right. So then eventually I just, they asked me to produce some things mm. and that's how I became, that's how I became a producer. Mm. So, um, so I, I could do the business side and the, the art side, which is, well, that makes me kind of unique because yeah. I could do, you know, I, I can even act in my act in my films. You know, I try to find films that have a good part that I can play. So that's nice. another way I can control my career. Control your own so, destiny. I think that's an interesting thing, like um, to be able to, like you see that nowadays with artists and stuff like that. There was something said um, about the concept that when when you know, music is produced and you go through a distribution and you get distributed by one of the major guys, that artist makes very little money out of it. And so the people right. are suing for 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 uh, royalties or suing for um, mm. for rights of those. Usually, the distributor, not the artist. And so the artist self produces and produces it themselves. They get to keep all the money. And so you've right. you've got this whole shift between the artist now not necessarily relying on distribution. Same things happen in books with Amazon. Um, yep. Same now it's happen- happening in films and TV. That's yeah. what I do. So it so opens I- up, and you've got all this streaming TV. So once upon a time. Right. You know, New channels to come on now you can come on hundreds of them um yep. so i think it's a huge opportunity for people to self-produce self-create when some producer would say oh no you're horrible you're not going on you're not putting you on that whereas then you can say oh, i can do it like rocky i suppose is a probably classic example of that and he had to fight the real big boys to get it so right journey app's a huge opportunity and i think it's interesting what you've done is kind of meld <laughs> the the various things you want to do into into your own little world if you like and you've got you can switch out between the two. So I think that's a, probably a smart way to sort of future proof yourself in some respects because at least you can always duck out if something just gets goes wrong, the you know, voiceovers suddenly become hard, then you can always switch to something else. Right. Or I go with what's you know, I go with what hot what's hot at the time, you know, like is all businesses ebb and flow. So I well, the the ideal thing is to have one of the businesses being uh, plentiful and you know, another business maybe down at the time. So that's 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 the the ideal goal doesn't always happen that way, but that's, uh, you know, it's, it's just more have, oars in the water, basically. For, <laughs> so Better to have a plan, right? <laughs> so Oh, exactly. I mean, and, and stuff I all love doing. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not even like it's, it doesn't feel like work at all. So, so I'll ask you, I'll ask you a question. It's probably for entrepreneurs, right? Legal to me is the trickiest mm-hmm. bit for most people. Most right. people don't get legal advice when they should have got legal advice. Um, yep. And other people, you know, like they, they go to legal advice every five minutes. So I call them a hypochondriac. So as soon as they want to, <laughs> you probably get this in your clients. So they start getting your check something. So what are you checking this for? It's obvious. What's the best yep. piece of advice you can give yep, someone from true. a legal perspective if, if they're, um, I guess, writing legal agreements, they're signing legal agreements, they're doing all this sort of stuff? Do, do you get that sort of scenario? What's the best piece of advice you can get? Because obviously you can spend a lot of money on legal advice and get no result, right? Right. So uh, the best piece of legal advice I can give is to know when you need legal advice <laughs> to, to, to become experienced enough to know, because, mm-hmm. you know, if you're going to, if you, people shouldn't set up their own LLCs. Like I see that all the time. Mm-hmm. They should let, let their professional, their accountant or their lawyer handle that. One mistake um, then it's a big bad idea, right? <laughs> right. And you're not, and you're not going to find out that you made a mistake until you're sitting in court. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's what you're going to find out. So, Anytime you have a contract that you either have to, to draft or sign, if you want to draft it yourself, let your lawyer look at it first before before it goes out. Or if it comes in, if it's coming in, you should definitely have someone review it because I can I can almost guarantee you when you get a contract in from a client that there's going to be things in there that have to be changed mm-hmm. because it's going to favor the, it's going to favor the client. The client's lawyer wrote it. Yep. And it's going to be all one-sided. So there's going to be things in there that you need to change. So if you, lease, not, if, if you're ex- lease a building, you know, like the pieces, give the guys giving you the lease is there's all pitched for him, right? It's not for the right. Person it, it, exactly. Yeah. So if you're experienced enough as an entrepreneur in that business, so you know the changes to make great. But if you don't, then you should have your lawyer do it for you. And the other thing you can do is if you, even if you are experienced enough, and I have clients like this, like you mentioned, I have very experienced entrepreneurs they'll make the changes and then they'll send them over to me for a second look to make sure that, that they got everything and that I can make suggestions. And that is a fraction of the cost mm. of, you know, what it would cost to have me do it from scratch. So 
that's a way to use your attorney's uh, knowledge and not have to, you know, pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for it. So to keep, you know, keep the cost down. So yeah, that, I think that's that, the best piece of advice I could give. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think you always got to think about what's the worst can happen to me, right? If, if I sign this, what's going to, <laughs> like I've signed some agreements over the years and I don't think it would have made any difference at the time. But when I looked at it, I thought to myself, what's the worst that can happen to me here? And if I can handle that, well, then fair enough. Right. But well, if, if it's not, if it's a if it's a high ticket item, mm. you definitely should get a second set of eyes. You know, so if you're if you're exposed for a lot of money, yep, either making it or having to pay out, then you should you know should have you should have someone look at it because you're going to be paying again a fraction of of the the worth of the, that contract. Mm. And you know you don't want to be you don't want to be sitting a, as a defendant in a multi million dollar or multi hundred thousand dollar or even ten thousand dollar lawsuit oh, so exactly you know, if it's something that can be avoided that's mm-hmm. you know that that's what you pay your attorney for that's that's our job so and people people are more litigious than ever i mean you know i think it, we probably rubbed off a little bit in australia now like it's probably not as bad in australia than it was in the u.s but it's getting worse now because people you know people are willing to go to court for almost anything now so you know you, you, just to be a nu- nuisance in some respects just to get a better deal <laughs> right? i mean in the, for personal personal things you know, people are definitely more litigious, mm. but for business dealings, I think that's pretty consistent because like if someone breaches a contract and they're losing money, they're going to bring a lawsuit or they're going to do something to try to recover their money. Mm. So I, I think that that's a little different for business mm. than it is for on the personal side like, for yeah, litigation. Like, yeah. And I mean, normally you don't do it to annoy someone unless you're really <laughs> up for a fight, but at the end of the day, it's, um, yeah. Or if there's a lot of money involved. Yeah, exactly. The right. reason. Like if there's a small sum, they're not going to, you know, you're not going to get sued over a small sum, but you yeah. still may have, have to answer a, you know, a legal letter or something like that. So, mm-hmm. you know, cause money's money and businesses are going, they're not just going to walk away from money. If someone breached a contract, they're going to try to try get luck. the money back, yeah, try luck. you know, Right, exactly. Maybe the company's out of business, and so they're not going to pursue it. But you know, there's business is a little different. So I don't, I don't see, I don't see inflated litigation in business, but I do see inflated litigation for personal things. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so thank you so much for coming on. Um, so you've got a, um, I guess, a bit of shameless promotion. So you've got a book. Um, I yes. The name of that book. It's called. Let me tell me. Tell me the name of the book. Voice Over Legal. I think it's called. yes. Okay, so that's illegal, correct? That's a an Amazon best-selling book. Um, and what's the best way to get in touch with someone who wants to talk to you? I'm not sure what they want to talk to you about. Who are you looking for? <laughs> Who'd you like to get? Yeah, so well, give you, Spielberg, which I can't really range, but <laughs> I'll give you both my website. So my, okay, my cool. law website is r o b s c i g e s q dot com. That's my law. Cool. Uh, my acting is r o b p a g l i a rob peglia dot com. That's my acting oh. site. Oh, right. That's my stage name, Paglia. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a better plan, right? Uh, it's cool. we'll <laughs> a little easier to pronounce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll put those links up as well so people can, can find them if they haven't listened properly because a lot of people pay, less, pay attention. So I really appreciate your time. And um, maybe we'll get you back soon when we have a have a next exciting inst- installment on your acting. Great. Perhaps. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I've got films that, uh, that are coming out. So, And uh, I've got a couple on Prime, so I, I'd be glad to come back. For sure. Well, thanks so much, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. That's a wrap on another awesome episode for the Startup Secret Show for Nippernors. Just before you go, if you like this episode, we'd be very grateful for a five star review. Please also consider recommending the show to a friend or two. Make sure you subscribe for future episodes at StartupSecrets.show right now. Until next time, if you're an Nippernor, make a start on your next great business idea today.